You're not living with Jesus, trust me, you're not going to die for him. I have never seen a man die for a cause he didn't live. Praise God, we have some people this morning who have made up their mind that heaven will be taken by storm. They plan to be transplanted from the kingdom of darkness this morning. Oh, into the kingdom of grace. And then into the kingdom of glory. You have loved us so much, dear yes. Father, tongue cannot tell. Yes, Lord. And you want to save each and every one of us. Yes, Lord. And you are still calling men and women to surrender their lives to you so that they can have a place in your eternal kingdom. Yes, Lord. I pray that at this moment, dear Father, you will cover your people, those who have made the decision to follow you into the watery grave of baptism. Yes, Lord. I pray, dear Father, that your Holy Spirit will take full control of them. Yes, Lord. Holy angels will protect them. Yes, Lord. Lord, wherever they have problem, we ask that you will bring deliverance, yes, Lord. that you will bring sustenance in their Father, so that they will never be the same again, and that you will work through their life each and every day, so that they may have the assurance that you are always with them. Bless them continually now, dear Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People who come to this church, don't come for any job. Right now, you know, give me some cloud here. People who come here are serious about their salvation. Final movements of God in the earth, my dear friends. Don't let this train pass you by. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I want to say a pleasant happy Sabbath to those who are viewing us via live stream. Pray that as you listen, that you will be blessed by this morning's meditation. You know, it is a blessing to live in this country, believe it or not. I am an American through naturalization. And I'm a Jamaican by birth. And it is good where, when folks can come to this country and make themselves progressive, never forget where they came from. I do commend Sister Brenda. She's our community service leader. Goes to Belize very often because that's her native country it does take back things to assist uh, the population there and he'll be traveling this week wednesday and i think sister henry will be making the pilgrimage with her we pray that god will give them safe traveling journeys that they will be a blessing to those whom they come in contact with that through their efforts planted that will germinate in the loud cry of the three angels message amen also we have our principal walker here ella please stand and his wife please stand you know it is good when he comes you know he is the principal of the ephesus academy and um we do thank you elder we do promote christian education we're in that time frame where many are contemplating whether to send their where to send their kids well let me help you out all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. It doesn't really cost, it pays. It pays every step of the way. There are assistance that can be given you that will assist you to make that a reality. But Elder Walker lost his sister, Gloria. They're making preparations for the finalization. We want to keep them in their prayers. Amen? 
know that um, death is never an easy thing, and um, but we look for that day. Never have to be subjected to the last enemy. Please pray for them as they travel and make that arrangement. Let us support them, brethren. Our prayers and otherwise. Funeral is cost. It does cost. We are a family. It doesn't matter where you are or what conference you belong to. We are a family. And I want to tell you, you're not going to have no east or west or north and south in the new earth. You're going to be one, one fold. We'll definitely have one shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. Amen? So, Ella Walker, we're praying for you, man, at this time, that God will give you the strength and your family in this, this sad time. We're going to pray. Do we all have a lesson? Do we all have one? Right? Um, Pastor Maraj? Brother. Yeah, all right. Um, I went to school with his brother, Alvin. Yes, yes, yes. Welcome, sir. Um, welcome, 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 welcome. All right, let us, let us pray. Almighty God who art in heaven, Lord, we have come to a very solemn time in earth's history. Dear Lord, people are not so much receptive to spiritual things. Lord, this morning we have come, Lord, because we desire a word from you. We're not here because of a mere formality. We're here because we desire a deeper walk, a more meaningful consecration in our spiritual lives. We pray, dear God, that through this morning's message, that bosoms will be unlocked. That you will speak to your people, Lord. May this message transform us. May it move us towards the kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name. Those who don't know, we have been gracefully going through the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. The author of it is the beloved John Bunyan. Said by one that this book, The Pilgrim's Progress, does offer practical instructions in godliness. Ellen White does affirm the book, and she says in Review and Herald, May 30, 1911, three years before she passed, she says, The book, The Pilgrim's Progress, it portrays the Christian's life so accurately and presents the love of Christ so attractively that through its instrumentality, hundreds and thousands have been converted all because of the work of John Bunyan. We are on lesson number 55, a plane or a place called ease. Now, I must admit, brethren, well, I'll tell you a story about a man who was unemployed. Sometimes in life, it's the little things that makes a difference, you know. Little things should not be overlooked, Ellen White says. He was unemployed, he needed a job for 15 months, he was out of a job. But his field of, 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 of education was a very unique field. And so when the job opened up, 15 applications came in. And all were qualified. And so he did the application. And he was told by the receptionist, listen, the person who does the hiring is a stickler, for lack of word. And she prizes promptness. So please be on time for your interview. So Monday morning, guess what? He was running late. He got to the, the place. It was a tall building. He had to go to the 12th floor. And as he was opening the door to go in, he saw a lady walking, coming. But normally, you know how we do it sometimes. You, you're in a rush, but decency says that men should hold door for women, right? I hope we still do that, right? So he had to rush, but he said, okay, let me just tell the door. And as the lady walked in, she says, thank you very much. We wish we had more men in this company like this. So finally, uh, they went their ways, and as he got to the floor where he the interview, he met the receptionist, and lo and behold, it was the lady who he opened the door for, was who did the interview, and he got the job. But the clincher was not so much his resume, because everybody looks good on paper. 
was the courtesy. Little things can make or break a deal. As I'm going through the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, I must admit, man, this was not a lesson. I had to really harness my energy to write this one. I usually begin on Sunday to kind of get everything done by Wednesday, Thursday, and get them printed. As I was getting ready for next, or the, the next lesson, this paragraph caught my attention. Now I'm going to read it to you. It's in your handout now. Bunyan says now, Then Christian and hopeful out went them again, the Bayans, and went till they came to a what? Delicate plain called what? Ease. Where they went much with much content. But the plain which was but narrow, so they were quickly got over it. Now I must admit, I said to myself, a plain call ease. Now I was going to just bypass this because I mean it's only a plain call ease. Fritz said, no, not. There's something instructive in this. I wonder what Bunyan meant by this and how does it apply to us today, this part of the vineyard. Now let's survey the book. We left Christian the last time that he had to go through some serious obstacles. He should have come in, but nevertheless. First, he had to battle with Apollyon. Remember that one? He got a mortal wound. Then he had to come now through the valley of the shadow of death. Then he met two pagans, Pope and Pagan. And then he encountered some false pilgrims, which we had talkative. And we had Mr. Byans. And then he now came to Vanity Fair, where Faithful lost his life. So all through his journey, it has been very tedious. There has been obstacles, and there, has to be a ch there are serious challenges that he must surmount. And this speaks to us, you know, that Christianity is not a better ease. It is a warfare. Yes. And in that, Bunyan now interjects a little plane, a plane called ease. And what can we glean from this now? I want you to fill it in now, right? This is what I believe Bunyan meant now. The plane called ease. What does it mean? The plane of ease, this represents a... A brief freedom, brief freedom now from controversies, difficulties, and annoyance, and work in the Lord's service, which lasts for a while. Most of our Christian life will consist in spiritual warfare. The Lord does promise intervals of rest. So we have controversies, we have difficulties, we have annoyances, we have work, we have struggles, but the Lord in his goodness and in his mercy, he, he, he promises an interval of rest. Even the woman, when the, the dragon pursued her, she was given wings that she may fly into the wilderness, that she may rest from a season. It's true that it is not an easy thing to maintain a balance in our spiritual life. The active and the progressive. The difficulty to maintain the two and to keep each in its relative uh, proportion to the other. We must not be so active as to neglect communion or so contemplative as to become unpractical. And because of the fallen nature, there is a strong tendency in our lives to run to extremes. Some do too much, and some do nothing at all. And there is a proclivity for those that do too much to do more, and those that do nothing to still do nothing. And this is not right. And I want to tell you something this morning. A, a personal Christ demands personal service. If we plan to wear our own crown, we must do our own share of the work. Laziness is an acquired vice. We're not born lazy. We acquire it as we go through life. 
One great preacher said that we need balance in our lives. Just how much we need, I believe, is the Holy Ghost is the only one qualified to give us that. One great preacher said that the strong are not always vigorous. He said that the most educated are not, not always right. He said the brave are not always courageous. And the joyous are not always happy. Then he says, above all, above all, are we not all a little off balance at times? I believe we are. And as you look at the Bible, this is a balanced book, brethren. And as you go from Genesis to Revelation, there are illustrations in nature and in the journeys of Israel that projects balance. The Exodus was a great movement. Over a million left Egypt, including mixed multitude. But in their journey, we see balance. God gave them a cloud by day and a fire by night. That's balance. Someone once said that the bow that is always bending will soon break. Nature testifies that some plants grow in shades while others flourish in the sunlight. We need balance this morning. Hey, Rachel was more beautiful, but Leah was more fruitful. balance this morning and yes it is true that Jacob wrestled all night but then he as a result he limped all his life Moses hand grew heavy in intercession rest balance this morning in my discourse by asking a question. Question number one now says, what is one of the most, one, what is one of the many things that the, the Christian is compared to in the scriptures? Now, we are likened to many things. Some are goats. <laughs> Salt. Light. Etc. cetera. And et cetera. But I like the comparison the Apostle Paul likens us to. And it is so germane this morning for the plane of ease. 2 Timothy 2, 3. The King James Version says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good what? Soldier for Jesus. To Timothy. And no man that warreth and entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a good soldier. The Apostle Paul likens the, 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 the Christian as a soldier. And this is so instructive to us today. We are soldiers in the Lord's army. We have to fight even though we have, don't we say it oftentimes? We are soldiers and soldiers are constantly on the battlefield. They are going, they are fighting, they are defending. But even the nation that sends out soldiers implement policies whereby soldiers are not always fighting. It's called R&R. &R. What does it mean? It's in your handout. It's a military slang. It suggests rest and recuperation or rest or relaxation or rest and recreation. It, it is a brief period, a brief period where the government discharges their soldiers and they can go at home and rest and if they should die in their R&R &R, they are still on active duty Virgin says sometimes our master may require us to do may sorry our, sometimes our master may not require us to do anything more than just to stand still he says, but you know that John the footman behind his master's chair and if his master bids him stand there, he is true as servant 
as there are other attendant who is sent upon an errand of the most utmost importance. He goes on to say that th there are times for soldiers to lie in the trenches as well as to fight the battle. God gives us brief periods of rest, R and R. Now to get the illustration now, I want to draw a picture. If you have your Bibles, you need to go to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. And while you're going there now, I want to ask this question. Number 2 now says now. As the disciples prepared to labor for Christ. Follow me now. What three parts of their constitutions would be taxed heavily? This is the commission now. God is sending them out now. Now Paul tells us, for those who are in the Lord's service, if you are serious about the Lord's business, if you're not just a social loafer, but if you're serious and active in the Lord's work, there are three parts of your constitution that will be heavily taxed. And Paul highlights them. In Thessalonians, he says this in 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God for your whole your spirit, soul, and body may be preserved. So as you're in the Lord's service, there are three parts of your body that will be taxed heavily. And we know about tax here in America. We've got state, state tax, income tax, social security tax. Man, tax upon tax. But tax keep the system going. So as you're in the Lord's service, something is happening to you. You are being taxed heavily. One, your mind is being taxed. Because Christianity is a thinking man's religion and no fool can be a Christian. E.E. Cleveland told me not. You got to get our people to start thinking before you get them shouting. Because we are an emotional people. And sometimes that, that overrides reasoning. It is, there's a mental taxation in the Lord's work. Not just mental, there is a soul taxation. Sometimes you're drawn out. Your mind is taxed. Your soul is taxed. But not just your body will be taxed. And the good Lord knows this. The good Lord knows this. As a matter of fact, question three says now, what did Jesus say went out of him as he was about his father's business? He's doing the business now. His mind is taxed. His body is taxed. And in Luke 8, 46, it says now, And Jesus said, Somebody have touched me. For I perceive what? That virtue has gone out. That's strength. That's energy. That's sap. And every time Jesus did some great exploits, it taxed his body. Virtue went out of him and it's not just goodness in the original it means energy it will tax you this is why it said this i i thought the, I, this is just profound an appeal to mothers she says this females females possess less vital force than the other sex which is man and i thought about that you know it is true that man and woman, we are equal in being, but not in function. And I know some of these radical feminists, they can conceptualize that. We are equal in being, but we are not in function. And there are certain things, women, you were not built to do. Amen. Full stop. Amen. Just like man. And so God didn't give you enough vital force as he gave man because he didn't expect certain tasks you were, you should not do. Yes, you are a help meet. Somebody say help meet the bills. Hey. I'm <laughs> Less vital force than man. Then she says this now. Those who make great exertion to accomplish just so much work in a given time and continue to labor when their judgment tells them they should rest are never gainers. You are a loser. They are living on borrowed capital. 
They are expending their vital force, which they will need at a future time. And when the energy they have so recklessly used is, uh, is demanded, they fail for want of it. The physical strength is gone. The mental powers fail. They realize that they have met with a loss, but do not know what it is. Their time of need has come, but their physical resources are all exhausted. Everyone who violates the laws of health must sometime be a sufferer to a great loss or degree. And we are told that God will not work a miracle to preserve the health of any. He will not do it. And we are free moral age. You can eat what you want to eat, but trust me. The sowing precedes the reaping. And you sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. Then she says, now this is so profound in conflict of courage. She says, if in your handout, if Adam at his creation had not been endowed with 20 times as much vital force as men have now have the race which their present with their present habits of living violation of the law would have been extinct. In other words, we are living off Adam's vital force. And in some cases, when people expire, in some cases, I believe that their vital force, it runs out. It runs out. And that is why the wise man says uh, in Proverbs 31, 3, give not thy strength unto woman. This gigoloism, it destroys kings and ways. Don't give it all to a woman. You can give some to your wife, praise God. <laughs> but she won't need some for the Lord's business, for life itself. This thing has brought down kings. We need balance. Now, with that said, now, question number four now says, now, how did Jesus advise his disciples as they returned from their busy schedule? Now, you're in the book of Mark now. Now, the book of Mark, Mark 6, has over 56 chapters, verses, pardon me. Now, they're all broken down into context. Now, let me give you a breakdown now. Verses 1 through 6, Christ begins his ministry. And at the opening, these verses says he was, there was a rejection. They got him out. They were almost wanting to kill him. So the first six verses, Christ, he begins his ministry, but he's rejected by his own. Follow me now. So we have the rejection. Once you get to verse 7, through 13 now, we have the first assignment of the 12. He has been teaching them, instructing them. He's now given them a trial. You know, before you become a teacher, you have to do so much teaching units. So he sends them out on their assignment. And that is from verse 7 to 13. And Jesus now gives them specific assignment. He says in verse 7, and he called unto the 12. And began to send them forth two by two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. And commanded them that they should take nothing on their journey. Follow me now. Save, starve only. Nor script. Nor bread. No money in your purse. What? What kind of Sabbath is that? Verse 9 says, But be sharp with sandals and put on two coats. And not put on two coats. And he said unto them now, in whatsoever peace soever you enter into a house, you say peace and let your peace abide there. So let's analyze it now. He sends them out. He's specific. Watch it now. Right in your handout. First verse says now, verse 8 and 10 says, their journey was by foot because they had a staff. I deduce from this that from walking from place to place, there'd be a weariness of the flesh. They had no free will, no run or run togan in back in those days. They hadn't go by donkey either. They had to go by foot everywhere they went. They never had Dr. Scholes either. They had hard camel sandals. They had to walk 
everywhere they went, and they haven't started to preach yet. Matter of fact, I was talking to her. First time I went to England, man, I was so excited, man. I'm going over Europe now, could put on my resume. You know, I didn't make any kind of preparation. Just, just the saints going to take care of me, Ella Parks. Take care of who? First and foremost, man. I flew from Miami to Texas, Texas to Canada. Now I'm thinking now it's going to be like a, a little hour layover. Nine hours layover. I said, who does that? I'm in Canada, I don't know nobody. I sat at that chair for nine long hours. It was nine in the morning, my flight. I haven't even started preaching yet, Doc. There was no pillow. No, who does that? And, not, 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 and then when you got to England now, they had me in the middle. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you man, it's, it's brutal. You can't stretch. You're just like that. And you, you know what I'm saying? And then my, my legs started to swell. I was like, what's swelling? What's going on here? We are in this, and I haven't even started to preach yet. Taxation on the body. Hey, I tell them, you bringing me in? You can't get me an aisle seat or an emergency seat. I'm telling you, it is serious on your body, man. Yeah, I'm not even trying to get the first class. That's too much. I'm, I'm mercy on the saints. But if you want to get me out of this country, you know, 15 hours, I'm not going to be next to no window or in no middle. I need to stretch my legs. We're in this for the flesh. Watch it now. They had to preach and teach from memory. They had no PowerPoint. They had no Apple computer back then. And the scrolls were like this. You couldn't bring no scroll. It was all right here. So their arguments had to be intact. They had to have their, their, their scriptures all laid out. So this now produces a weariness of the mind. Let me tell you something, saints. This thing called preaching and working is no joke. Your body is taxed. And not with that now, they had to physically attend the sick. Heal and do hot and cold. Heal bath, Russia, a mud poultice. You're not hearing me. Bend to my clay. There's a weariness of spirit. So this, these three areas were taxed by them as they went. Follow me now. Now, when you get now, so the rejection, the assignment. Then now when you get to verse 14 through 29, a new figure emerges. John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, a firebrand, and he's preaching and teaching. And he says, the Bible says, even Herod feared John. And John called his number. John's ministry begins and his death. And you know how the story goes. John is preaching and Herodias didn't like John and her, her, her daughter did a wraparound pole event and dazzled the man. And what do you want? Give me the head of John the Baptist. All this has happened while the disciples are out preaching. And bear in mind, most of Christ's disciples were John's disciples. So they knew John. John told them to go further. Now, and by the way, John died at about 27. Yeah, how old do you think he was? 50? Six months apart. Come on, do the math. But 27, he is gone. Now, bear in mind, the disciples are out preaching, teaching, working, traveling now. So all this now, John, death. So when they return now from their preaching, they got the news. The Bible now says now, they returned. This is the context now. The death of John. 29 says now, and when his disciples heard of it, of what? John's death. They took up the corpse and laid it in a tomb. One version says they brought it to Jesus. 30 now says now, and the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told them all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So Christ, we're so excited, man. We got to tell you. And in the midst of that, Jesus said now, for 31, and he said unto them, come here for yourselves apart, a desert, desert place, and what? 
For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so as to eat. Follow me now. And they departed to a desert place by the ship. So as they returned, Jesus sized them up. He realized, jot this down, that there was a physical strain, physically physical strain on them. To be physical, on them. He saw that. They look weird because they walked everywhere they went. So physically, they were drained. Right? They also had now what we call an emotional strain. How do I know? Because John had died. And if you lost someone near and dear to you, you don't take that lightly, man. Days and months, and they could see on his face that their teacher had died, John the Baptist. The Bible says they took up the corpse, a headless body. Have mercy. That alone will cause you to get on medication, man. I remember one time I had a little dog man called Sashi. And we don't have no, no big name dog, a little mongrel dog. No, no, no pedigree. Love my little dog. And the dog ran out the, and got hit by a car. And that dog ran home and died in the yard. Things I couldn't eat for two weeks. I couldn't eat no kind of meat. Disturbed me. I just kept on seeing the image. So you can imagine a headless body, what it did to them emotionally. And Jesus knew that this is what they saw. Have mercy. Who takes that likely? Christ knew this. So physically they had a strain, emotionally, but spiritually they were strained. Because they were ministering. And as that, they had no me time. They, they, they were, how do I know? They couldn't even eat. But you know that's bad. When you can't even masticate your food. And it was in this context. Christ says. Come me apart. Rest. Why? What he said to them. Applicable to those who are active in the Lord. And why it says this, when the apostles returned from their first missionary journey, the Savior commanded them, the command was, come here apart yourselves and rest in this place. They had been putting their whole soul into labor for the people, and this was exhausting their physical and mental strength. It was, it was their duty to rest. It was a command to rest. Rest Jesus! When the people have no shepherd, yes, rest. Rest when the people are hungry, yes, rest. Rest when they're emotional, yes, rest. Rest when people are dying in their sins, yes. Rest. He says, Christ's words of compassion are spoken to his workers today, as surely as his disciples. She says, he who... He, he says to those who are worn and weary, it isn't always to be under the strain of work or excitement, even ministering to man's spiritual needs. For in this way, personal piety is neglected, interesting. And the powers of the mind and soul and body are overtaxed. Says self-denial is required of the servants of Christ and sacrifice must be made but God would not have all would have all study the laws of health and use reason when working for him don't let your zeal get the best of you stop and think and balance the thing he says a reason for working for him that the life which he has given, maybe what? Preserve. And so he took them to a country to rest. You know there is danger of overworking. Now this is not for lazy people. This is messages tailored for those who are actively working, not for the man. I'm talking for Jesus. Question 5 now says now, is there a biblical injunction against overworking? 
Yes, it is. The principles are there. Here are some. Ecclesiastes 12, 12, Paul says, uh, Solomon says, that much study is a weariness of the flesh. Listen, man, the other day I was putting a sermon together. Since I just, I started a tremor. You need to walk, son. And I'm an active person. I walk for one hour. Got my cleats on and just on the golf course. Moving. I had to let it out. Weariness of the flesh. When you're studying, the, even, the Bible, even the Bible can weary at times. Ecclesiastes 7.17 says, Why should you die before your time? And this is not about eating cardiovascular. You get that? Even sometimes working for the Lord, I'm going to show you, can kill you early. And God will not work a miracle to preserve any man's life. Oh, Lord, look how he's working for you. And you must use reasoning. You must use judgment. And don't let them fool you. Oh, in the name of Jesus, there is a power of a positive no at times. You can't say no and still make it to heaven. Yes, sir. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to say no. Hallelujah for that no. Praise the Lord. That was a Holy Ghost no. And don't put no guilt trip on people. He said, come rest. Matthew said now, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. Because they fainted. People were fainting. And they were scattered. They had no sheep, no shepherd. And look what he said now. Then said he unto them, the disciples, the harvest is plenteous. Go and overwork yourself and die for me. He said what? Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's only a few times in the Bible, Christ often said pray. Pray that your flight be not in the winter. And they prayed. He says pray that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers. The command didn't say overwork yourself. Pray. But he said, Pastor Not, you know, prayer brought you here. And the only thing can remove you is prayer. He said, we prayed for laborers. Don't overwork yourself. So yes, there is an injunction against overworking. Even in the Lord's work. I want you to follow me now. I'm reading again, Minister of Healing. She says, when Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest was great and the laborers were few. Here it is now. He did not urge upon them the necessity of careless toil. Ceaseless toil, thank you. Uh, to his toil, toil worn, toil worn workers today as the first disciples, he speaks word of compassion. Come and rest. While hear me, church, this morning. There is no underscore, no virtue in any Christian burning themselves out for God. You will not get a bigger crown. I'm sorry. No. You will not get a LeBron in points. You will not be closer to the, th to the throne of God. No. There is no virtue in it. God does not want us to burn out ourselves for him. He wants us to burn on for him. But don't burn yourself out. Virgin says, I love it. Not in your handout. I couldn't get everything in. He said, rest time is not waste time. Hallelujah. He says it is economy to gather fresh strength. Fishermen must mend their nets and we must every now and then repair our mental waste and set our machinery in order for future service. You've got to lubricate it. I was cutting my whatever hair I had left, man. I got one of those Andes. I said, something's wrong. I need some oil. Bam! Got to lubricate at times. He says now, 
while we are in this tabernacle, which is the flesh, not in your handout, we must every now and then cry, Halt! Stop! Then he says, and serve the Lord. I love, I wish I could write like Spurgeon. And serve the Lord, serve the Lord by holy inaction and by consecrated leisure or rest. So there is a thing called holy inaction. And there's virtue in it. And there is a thing as consecrated leisure. He says, God's ambassadors must rest or faint, must trim their lamps or let them burn low, must recruit his vigor or grow prematurely old. It's serious. It's serious. James White is a perfect example. I tell you something. You don't know who this man is. I've did some reading about him, and I trust me, he has touched my soul. Let me just show you how James. And we had a whole lecture on James White in Permian. Mean, you can go in our archives. Born in 1821. He died 1888. Eight, sorry, 1881, just seven years, he died seven years before 1888. And many believed if he was around, we would have been in the kingdom at that general conference session. That's the caliber, the force he had, the influence. Years old, he died. Man didn't even make it to three score and ten. Reason of strength, eating vegetarianism. That he was the husband of the prophetess. You don't get no closer than that. Yet God did not preserve his energy. Because even though he was zealous, he was reckless with his vital force. And he wasn't part like a rock star. He was traveling, preaching, writing, organizing. Raising money. This man lived a self. He even used his own money to pay ministers who were employed. When was the last time you saw any conference president doing that? I'll take half my salary. Let me hire three workers. They're not doing that. <laughs> They'll lay you off and say, we're going to pray for you, brother. <laughs> Many times he did that. I'm telling you, you will never know what James White meant to this organization until you get on the other side. Get this book called James White. Good book. Excellent reading. Very good. From 21, he started. Tall fella could sing. You get in the book. He was very instrumental in the present truth, little tracks. Who wrote them? He didn't argue for amazing facts. No, he wrote them himself. He was the author and the printer and the producer. He picked them up and he had a limp. He had to walk miles in Brunswick. He had injured himself working in a saw factory. When we got started, I asked anybody before, he was there. It was James who says, we build on the foundation of many generations. We're not going to deny what Huss and Wycliffe and Jerome and Latimer and Baxter did. We build on those men. He was no Joe Blow. The record says, not in your handout, that, 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 that he died in August 6, 1881, when he was only 60. He literally worked himself to death. And I'm going to show you, literally, the brethren leaned on him so heavily that his towering figure fell. His 60 years of life was spent unselfishly and sacrificially. No, and I mean, I can say this emphatically from General Conference with Timbuktu. I have not, not even C.D. Brooks or E.E. Cleveland, and these men work, none of them. None of them can come near James White in terms of labor. He did more than any other to build a high principle of efficiency into our church. And it killed him. It literally killed James White. His wife lived 34 years by herself. I took note. You're not going to wear me out and have some... some, some uh, casting over my, my wife. <laughs> Call my son Nate Boy. No, sorry, Bob. Hey, I've got, 
No, sir, dog. <laughs> Every man going to bear his own burden in this church. You're not going to work me to death. I'll run and leave you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and I mean that. See, I'm taking notes of James White. I'm not going out like that, sorry. 34 years. You're, come on. <laughs> no, sir, that's the thought of it alone. Amen. Calling my pretty wife, my family. No, sir, Bob. <laughs> Nightmare. No. And you know, before he died, Ellen had a dream. Saw it. Not in your hand, but I want you to, I want you to write it down. Ella Burns, I want you to read it something. You got I like that deep baritone voice you got. I'm, I'm high pitch. <laughs> Thank you. It's on the screen, so just work with me right now. This is the reference. Ellen White dreams of James White after his death. Pen manuscript, 38. You can put it in your phone. Put this in your phone, you'll get it. Now, I couldn't put it on because we just ran out of paper. Ella Burrs, please read now. It's in the screen, right? A few days since I was pleading with the Lord for light in regard to my duty. In the night I dreamed, I was in the carriage, driving, sitting at the right hand. Father was in the carriage, seated at my left hand. Now, that's, it. She, that's what she called her husband. This is a pet name. Follow the context now. Keep on reading now. He was very pale, but calm and composed. Huh. Why, Father, I exclaimed, I am so happy to have you by my side. Once more, I have felt, I have felt that half of me was gone. Father, I saw you die. I saw you buried, as though the Lord pitied me and let you come back to me again, and woe work together as we used to. It's a dream she's having now. Go on, read it now. Please read. He looked very sad. He said, the Lord knows what is best for you and for me. My work was very dear to me. We have made a mistake. What mistake we made now? This is the prophet now, Ellen White. We may, we're looking back. We made a terrible mistake, James White. What was the mistake? Keep on reading now. We have responded to urgent invitations of our brethren to attend important meetings. So they were called a call from east, west, north. So we got to go preach. We got to go teach. We got to evangelize. Keep on reading. We had not the heart to refuse. Couldn't because the cause of God was the harvest was so great, James. And the laborers were few. But we didn't pray. We thought we could do it all. Keep on reading now. These meetings have warned us both more mm. than we were aware. So there was something happening as they were preaching. The vital force was being sapped. And they never took time to replenish it. Keep on reading now. Our good brethren were gratified. But they did not realize that in these meetings we took upon us greater burdens than at our age we could safely carry. You get that? That spiritual burden. Keep on reading now. They will never know the result of this long continued strain upon us. Mm. God would have had them bear the burdens we have carried for years. Our nervous energies have been continuously taxed. And then our brethren misjudging our motives and not realizing our burdens have weakened the action of the heart. I have made mistakes the greatest of which was in allowing my sympathies for the people of God to lead me to take work upon me, which others should have borne. you get that? She said, I regretted that. It was not in God's order for me to do that. Keep on reading now. He looked at me appealingly and said, you will not, ne you will not neglect these cautions, will you, Ellen? Our people will never know under what infirmities we have labored to serve them because of our lives were interwoven with the progress of the work. But God knows it all. I regret that I have felt so deeply and labored unreasonably in emergencies, regardless of the laws of life and health. Here it is. God did not even work a miracle to preserve their life. We ain't doing half, one-tenth what they're doing. You didn't do it for them. You're not going to do it for me. You're not going to do it for you. Expects us to use good judgment. Got a brain? Use it. 
Use it. Use it, I beseech you. Keep on reading, please. He looked. Lord. The Lord did not require us to carry so heavy burdens and many of our brethren so few. We ought to have gone to the specific coast before and devoted our time and energies to writing. Uh -huh. Will you do this now? Uh -huh. Will you, as strength returns, take your pen and write out these things we have so long anticipated and make haste slowly? Uh -huh. There is important matter which the people need. Make this your first business. You will have to speak some to the people, but shun the responsibilities which have borne us down. Hear that? And listen, you can read the whole thing. Uh, here it is. But God laid this matter before, before God and make no response. So in other words, when, when the invitation came, she says, uh-uh, I'm going to pray about this one. God says, don't go. I don't care who it is. I'm not going. Not because somebody called you, come preach now. Oh, yeah. Must be of God. No. And that was how she lived. But it was too late for James. And then she woke. She said, man, I woke, but this dream seemed real. It was real. It was a reality. But kill him. Kill the man. 60 years old, man. 34 years she lived by herself. Stephen Haskell wanted to get married. She said, no, Haskell. Couldn't. He overworked himself. So here it is now, the balance. Is a danger of those who are actively working, preaching, serving, doing too much. Then we have the other extreme. Question number six. Now, what strong word does the prophet Amos use to denounce those who are at ease in the Adventist church? Amos 6, 1. This herdsman prophet. He ain't using no Queen's English right here. This is farmer language. He says what he means, and he's trying to mean what he says. He begins his denunciation with one word. He says, woe. Now, woe means watch out. He says, woe unto them that are at ease. Amos puts a woe. It's almost a condemnation. In other words, if you don't watch out, something will happen to you. A woe is upon those who are at ease in Zion. And the sad reality is that 10% still do 90% of the work. Majority of the people who come and sit in churches are collective hearers. They come for a good sermon. They never get involved. They have no ministry. They buy no books to give out. They do nothing. And they're very critical. Well, you should do it. Why don't you come do it then, sister? Get involved, I beseech you. The active are happy. I read a story about a man who, who locked himself, man, in a, in a refrigerator over the weekend. Man, this, this is some serious sub degree. On Monday, the security guard came and opened the door. He was alive. They asked him, how did you survive? The man said, I had to push large blocks of ice around. Myself active. That was how he stayed alive. You got to get active in some of our cold churches. You will freeze to death. You better get active. I said, you better get active for Jesus. Woe unto you who are at ease in this church or any other churches. Get involved. A personal Christ demands personal service. Now all can do everything, but we can do something. And now come tell me, we're going to stay and pray. You go, we're going to pray. No, 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 you need, you need to come, sister. Number seven now says, now what? The Apostle Paul mentions two kinds of burdens. What are they? And here it is now. This is the crux now. There are two burdens mentioned by the Apostle Paul. First, there is a burden to be sheared in the service. This is fear. There's a burden sheared. He mentions in Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. And he says this now. Bear ye one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now this burden, what is it now? Mutual forbearance. The context. Compassion towards each other. Sympathy. 
closeness of affection, swift, godlike readiness to help. That is the burden we bear. We share our mutual woes. I sympathize with you. I go in my pocket to help you. We are to bear those burdens in this church. But then he mentions another burden, which no man ought to ever bear or share. And if any man comes and asks you to bear this, run him. Run him and say, get, bear your own burden. There are burdens to be borne. When it comes on to witnessing, service of Christ, that cannot be shared. God has given me a work. You can't do it for me. And, I can't. and guess what? Did you know? If God has given you a work and your work is not done by you, it is left undone. And no one can do your work. And others could be lost by your negligence. That's how it is. Paul says now, for every man in the generic sense must bear his, his, his own burden. Note, Christ has assigned him a particular work which if it is not done by him, will never be done. He should patiently, cheerfully, constantly, and faithfully perform bearing this burden while in this world. But while you're bearing it, temper it. Don't overwork yourself. You can sit down for this quarter. Go for this church here. That's sin. You've served so long. Go ahead. And one of the reasons why I believe God asked them to rest, some people think, oh Lord, the church leans on them. If I'm not in this office, oh, it's going to crumble. And they take a disposition that they are indispensable. Some believe that, you know. So when it's asked for them to sit down, I can't do it, Jesus, no. No, you need to sit down. Rest. The church will roll on. And I tell you, Adventism was here before I got here. And if I dropped it tomorrow, it ain't gonna crumble. It's gonna roll on. Acreage was here before I got here. Did you know that? And when I do go, it's gonna still gonna be here. It's not built on me or a personality, it is built upon the enduring truth. It is true personality is different. That is true. I'm me. And God doesn't want any clowns. I was told by E. Cleveland, your individuality is your key. Don't try to be like me or Brooks. Be you. Do you. Your individuality is your key. God doesn't want a clown. Retain your individuality. So personalities differ. But the truth is the same. So guess what now? We have our burdens. But don't overwork yourself. Rest a while. God has given us a blueprint. What's the blueprint now? What's the blueprint? Jesus' ministry comprised of what? Two entities. There were two. All through the Bible. Fill it in now. There was what you call mountain time. Yes, mountain time. Mountain time. Matthew and Luke says oftentimes he would steal away by himself to a quiet place to pray, to reflect, to refresh himself. To get a new strength, new sap for the day's challenges. So he had mountain time. But then now he had Multitude time. Yes. We can't be Christians in solitude. We ain't no monastery here. Ain't no nunism in this church. You got to go out. I remember one time, man, I was, in, I was in college, man, and couldn't go home for the Thanksgiving. So my buddy said, man, we're going to have, have, have lunch at a covenant, convent. I don't know what possessed me. I was the devil, if you ask me. I said, we're going to hang with the sisters. Boy, I tell you, it was dark in Pennsylvania. Oh, they just look mashed potato. No, come on, mercy, man. They didn't even come outside. That was holiness for them. Can't be Christians in solitude. Salt is no good if it's in the bottle. It has to rub itself with the meat. You're not hearing me. You have to mingle. But there's mountain time. And you have to keep it like that now. Now, number nine says now, if the Christian plans to maximize, follow me now, 
his ability to serve the Lord. Which two biblical characters, spirit, must be embodied in their own life? If you plan to do great exploits for Jesus, you're going to have to pray God to give you these two biblical characters, spirit. And they're both women. Here it is now. In the book of Luke. Now it came to pass. Luke 10, 38. As they went, that they entered into a certain village. And certain woman named what? Martha received him into her house. And she said to her sister Mary, which also sat at Christ's feet and heard his words. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore come help me. Tell her just come here, lazy sister. Put her in her place. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Wrong, huh? Why are you so fidgety? You upset too easily, man. You're too careful about many things. He says now, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen a good part which shall not be taken away from her. Hear me now. You plan to serve God aright in this church. You need the Martha spirit, and you need the Mary. God did not rebuke Martha. It wasn't a rebuke. Correction. Balance the thing, Martha. As some teach. No, no, no. She wasn't possessed by the devil. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, jot this text down, that both Martha and Mary were deeply loved by Jesus. The Bible says that in the book of John 11, 5, that he loved, that, that, that agape love. He loved them deeply. Now, we have a problem now. You see, the Martha spirit now, watch it now. Fill it in now. The Martha spirit concerns itself with external activity. It's good. It's noble. It is commendable. But she was only focusing on the external. She's got to bake. She's got to cook. She's got to kneel the dough. She's got to fry the fish. Whatever she's doing. And you need that in the church. We are saved by grace through faith. But we are judged by your works. If you love me, cheat my... There's some doing. For God's love, he gave. There is action and activity. That's the Martha spirit. But we have a problem now. No. It manifests itself in preaching, teaching Sabbath school, track distribution, and many other missionary activities and the day-to-day -day activities of the church, board meeting, elders meeting, all kind of meeting. You, you need that. We have chaos and pandemonium. But it puts earnest strength that part of the life which is visible to man and forget that portion of the life which is secret between you and your God. That's the Martha spirit. That's not good. You have to rest a while. And the rest is not sleeping in bed till 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 13 o'clock. No. Oh, I'm resting, Lord. Come to church. No, no, that's not the rest. That, there wasn't a rest. And that rest wasn't the Sabbath rest either. It wasn't the Sabbath rest. It come rest a while. Get him confused. Different kind of rest. But then we have the Martha, Mary spirit now. Mary. Mary spirit now concerns itself with the rest and external activity. We say, did Mary work? Of course she did. As a matter of fact, Martha's works are forgotten. But as long as the gospel is preached, there might be an extra line. Let's jot it down for me somewhere, right? As long as there's an extra, there's a, there's a, um, there is a, as long as the gospel is preached, whatsoever Mary did is always mentioned. Martha's works well, has you heard about it? I've never heard any songs sung about Martha. I've heard songs sung about what Mary did. 
all through the Gospels, but not Martha, and both of them were, because Mary had that restful spirit. Note, you see, Martha's fruits ripened very quickly. Mary's takes time. Who likes coarse ripe fruit? When nature ripens it, man, it has an aroma. You, you, you eat the seeds and it's white. Even put it in water, it's like chalk. That's how we eat mangoes, good mango, eat your mango. We eat skin, we eat everything. Tell it. That's how we eat a good mango. No, now, when Lazarus was dead, Martha is always, she's running. <laughs> Mary sat still in the house. Mary is always reflective. Martha is always doing. But yet, Mary's works outshine Martha's work. You are not losing time while you're feeding your soul. You gotta get that sense. We don't hear these sermons too often. I don't preach them too often either. <laughs> I need to do more than I'm saying. <laughs> Watch it now. While contemplating, you are getting purpose, strengthened, and motive purified. You are rightly used. Serious enough. I'm going to show you something. This is going to blow your mind. Watch it now. Fill it in now. The spirit of Mary, fill it in now, always be original. Original. Fresh. Cutting edge. Never commonplace. In other words, when you take the Mary spirit, you will always have something new. Powerful to say. Like, you just can't get enough of it. Your preacher speak something new and cutting edge. You're just fresh. Mary, Martha is stale. Monotony. You're doing the same thing year in, year out. You have no time to think of new ways of serving God. New ideas. And as Martha, Mary Satcher is saying, what can I do? What service can I perform? That will burst like a bubble in the soul. And she thought of something. Did it? The songs are sung about it. But not Martha's works. Martha never rested. She's always doing. No. It, the danger. What's the danger now? The danger is that our Christian activity can become a substitute or communion with Christ. Let me tell you something. Say, I gotta catch myself. It, to build these things, I'm on a time. They gotta be printed, edited, build PowerPoints. This ain't devotion. And sometimes I catch myself, boy, you ain't had your devotion this morning. But I'm building sermon. That ain't your devotion. Pull the handbrake up not. Get your devotional book. Sing your hymn, yes, by yourself. Yes. And pray for yourself. Yes. You see, activity is not a substitute for communion. That is why Christ said they were preaching, they were teaching, they were healing. That was good. And he said, come. Rest. A while. There's almost everything in life has a substitute. For those who are vegans, you don't eat egg as an egg replacer. But nothing can replace or substitute your personal worship. I don't care what. I don't care. There's nothing. There's no service that you can, no activity can replace your morning and evening worship, your meditation. Nothing. There's no replacement for that. Doing your soul great harm. I'm doing myself great harm when I think building PowerPoints and building lessons. Oh, they're good. This ain't no devotion. Whole different concept to build and teach 
as to reflect. Now, you know what I'm talking about now. Preparing to give is a dip, your mind works differently. But for yourself, it's a different side of the brain you use. Press the while. As we close, watch it now. Which came first, chicken or the egg? Eggs and the chicken. All right? Watch it now. Got these down now. Consecration must come before service. I say consecration must come before service. Service will never substitute your consecration. I'm telling you, saints, you're going to rob yourself a great blessing. Number two, worship must not, worship must precede activity. Must always. Giving out tracts is not your worship. It's an activity. The quiet time with Jesus, that is the strength. Thirdly, watch it now. The king must come before the king's business. I get that one. Yeah, we're not here hooping and hollering and foaming. We're not going to do that here today. No, we don't do that. We, it seems, you know, it is said that the greatest torture you can put some folks through is to tell them thinking. <laughs> Give me the answer. Give me the answer. No, think it through. King must come before the king's business. Ellen White says, Israel made a serious mistake. They worship the ark over the God of the ark. That was a fatal mistake they made. Where are we going then? Well, some are going to go to hell if they don't change. Need to rest. Die prematurely. Trust me, you will, you will die prematurely. Hey, it wasn't your time. Then as we close, she says, one thing that Martha needed was a calm. There it is. Devotional spirit. She didn't have it. A deeper anxiety for knowledge concerning the future immortal life. The graces necessary for spiritual advancement. She needed less activity for the things which pass away and more for those things which endure. I have learned something this week that sometimes less attempted more achieved. You think on that. Sometimes in the Lord's service, less attempted, more achieved. Jesus would teach his children to seize every opportunity for gaining that knowledge that, which, that will make them wise unto salvation. Here it is now. The cause of Christ needs careful energy. Here it is now. Martha, Mary, but not energy first. Mary first, careful, energy workers, energetic. There is a wide field for Martha's with their zeal in activity, religious. They need zeal, but let them first sit down with Mary at the feet of Jesus. Let diligence, promptness, and energy be sanctified by the grace of Christ. Then the life will be an unconquerable power for good. It's like Mary. You need to sit at the feet of Jesus. Learn, learn of him. Having chosen the better part, which will make, never be taken from us. Like Mary, we need to be ever abounding in the work of the Lord. Martha, higher Christian attainments can be reached only by being much on. Yes, a plain call is. It's short-lived. But we need some R. Don't die before your time. Don't rob your family of their time, your loved ones. Somebody can always preach. That's the fact. Say something. We were coming here today, this morning, and we had a, there was a traffic jam. But I guarantee you, that traffic jam had held us up. You wouldn't say, well, there's no benediction. Benediction. No. 
Eromia, the parks, Dean, the principal. Oh, I will lay hands on somebody speedily. And the work would have still, still been blessed. Hey, I, I, the other day I was reading and I found this. It's just so encouraging. It doesn't really gel with the sermon, but hey, it's truth anyhow. Version said now, as I close, what then? Cast the burden of the present along with sin of the past and the fear of the future upon the Lord. Who forsake not this his saints. Live by the day, hey, by the hour. Put not trust in frames or feelings and feelings. Care more for a grain of faith than a ton of excitement. Yeah, that's what I said to mercy. <laughs> he says, trust in God alone and lean not on the reeds of human help. Be not surprised when friends fail you. It is a failing world. Never count upon immut immutability in man. Inconsistency you may reckon with without fear or disappointment. He says, serve God with all your might while the candle is burning. And then, when it goes out for a season, you will have less to regret. Be content of be nothing for that you really are. And do remember the rest. Remember the rest.
can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid your all that the spirit control now you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul as you yield him your body Come rest a while, Jesus says. May God preserve both mind, soul, and body. And I appeal this morning to those people who are active in the Lord's work and emotionally you're drained, mentally you're drained. Physically, you're a drain. Spiritually, you're a drain. And you want to take the Lord's offer this morning. You want that rest. Just slip from your seat and come to the front this morning, Lord. We need that rest. Job is sapping your energy. You got those crazy co workers, man. Those crazy kids you're dealing with. You got that cynical husband, that unconverted wife. You got that demon-possessed brother-in-law. Tapping your energy. You need to come rest a while, man. Why would you die before your time this morning? We don't want to go out like James White. Pray that the good Lord will send forth laborers you can't do it all God never intend for you to do it all pace yourself don't burn out like the virgins before the midnight cry keep enough oil in your lamp so when you're called upon you can do great exploits and what I say to you I'm saying to myself because I'm not lazy my sin will not be doing too less. It may be doing too more. I need balance. Less attempted. More achieved. Less attempted. More achieved. Father in heaven, Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus. We have let our exuberance our zeal override reason Lord and you're calling a people this morning Lord to be center to be balanced in everything that touches the kingdom of God Lord some in this church they are just working and working and working and working Lord while others just sit by Lord stir us up your Jesus Comfort the saints and discomfort the sinners in Zion this morning. Woe unto those who are at ease in Zion, Lord. We want to rest. We have burdens, Lord. Emotional, we are drained. Spiritual, we are drained. Physically, Lord, it's taxing our bodies. We need to be rejuvenated. For those, Lord, who came forward, Lord, you know that they're serious they need help in some part of their life I pray you will apply that healing balm 
may we manifest that mere spirit lord may we give time for meditation for contemplation for relaxation and as you inspire us with new ideas cutting edge fresh ways to teach the gospel give us that martha zeal lord all in a day's work to serve Jesus, all right. And alas, when you shall come, Lord, remember us here at Acreage. And as Nehemiah said, Lord, forget not the good deeds we have done. Because we are not saved by them. We are saved by grace through faith. But our works is a testament that we love Jesus your hands we commit mind soul body and spirit preserve it O lord until you come is our prayer in jesus name. let the saints say amen. amen to god be the glory great things he has done is your all on the altar is your all on the altar